a really warm welcome from me and from everyone at the Centre for Social Justice. My name is Christian, I'm the director of the CSJ, and it is a real privilege to have you here. My thanks to our hosts for this evening, are doing a most wonderful job of providing a room and everything we need for a fantastic evening. Um, I also want to thank, of course, David Lamby for giving up an evening to be with us, and um, in anticipation of what you're going to say, which I have no doubt is going to be fascinating, thank you for bringing um, what you're going to say to us tonight. And of course, thank you to all of you for being with us. It's a really exciting evening for everyone at the CSJ. We're really proud to be hosting this evening and this series that we are running with the Labour Party. This is the middle of three lectures. So the first lecture we had last month with Graham Allen, MP, terrific Labour MP, who is pioneering much work on the early years and early intervention, particularly with our most vulnerable families. Of course, tonight we have David speaking on family and community in the good society and all the points he wants to raise with us this evening. And then next month, we have John Crudus, who is leading the Labour Party's overall policy review for Ed Miliband. He'll be speaking on a number of interesting topics for us just before Christmas. So we would love to have you back. It's a different venue, but love to have you back for the final part of our series, although they've been such a success uh, that I think we'd love to do some more next year. And it's really important that we're doing this because the CSJ is proud to be independent, to work cross-party. Now, I've not, you know, you can always read that in the papers, like the Daily Mail will often present us as a Tory think tank, and whatever we publish, even if it was to say Ian Douglas Smith should resign, they'll put a picture of Ian Douglas Smith next to that report and claim that it's his report. So we do what we can to promote our independence, but um, and we're proud to be working with the Labour Party and lead, leading Labour Party figures on this series. And it's a fascinating time for Labour. We've had Ed Miliband really claiming so much of the initiative and the or perhaps the centre ground with his call to become a party of one nation, which we saw last month at the Conservative Club, at the Labour Party conference. And it's rattled Conservatives, and they are working out how to respond to a Labour Party that invokes this reigning. Um, so we are really honoured to have uh, David with us tonight. And of course, on the Labour list this week, a very important um, Labour website where blogging and ideas takes place, we've had John Crudis editing website this week and David's had an article on the website. It's really worth going to if you want to understand something of what's happening in the Labour Party about the debate it's having internally. The CSJ was set up to look at some of the deepest social problems that affect Britain. We were moved by really shocking levels of social breakdown many years ago. It was established by Ian Duncan Smith and he travelled to a number of communities where he became shocked and angry at what he found and the reality of what people were living in. He spent one um, day in, well, a number of days, but the first day it really came home to him was when he was in uh, Carlton, an East House in Glasgow, where life expectancy is 54 years old, where there's a huge level of um, worklessness and family instability and failing schools and massive levels of debt and crime. And people who feel long written off by government, whose aspirations have been totally quashed by a culture of low expectations or misdirected policy. And you had Britain on the rise in one sense with growing employment and GDP and economic prosperity coming to the majority. But there was a group in British society that was totally unmoved by that, and actually going the opposite direction. And so the CSJ was established to look at that, um, that sort of set of issues and to work with people who are living in those communities, experiencing poverty, and these social problems to try and find solutions and to give them a voice. So we're a deeply practical think tank. It doesn't come down to people like me using Google, making a few phone calls to generate our policy ideas. We are proud to have a network of about 350 small, grassroots, brilliant charities that are on the poverty fighting front line. They are the organizations that give us our intelligence. They give us our evidence base. They often promote the ideas that we need. Most of the CSG ideas we find in our reports are, are things we've found working brilliantly in different parts of the country. So we're a deeply practical organisation. And we look at the root causes and the things that uh, cause people to be in poverty. In terms of tonight's speaker, you all here because you don't you know, you need to really go into huge levels of introduction um, for David. 
it all, all here because of um, the fascinating politician he is and the way he's sort of trying to create a debate. But I just wanted to mention a few things about David before he comes to speak. He was born in Tottenham um, and uh, is, is a proud man of that Tottenham community and has been rooted in that community for a long time. And it comes across almost immediately when you meet him. He was one of five children. He became the first uh, black Briton to study a master's in law at Harvard Law School. I think it went over in 1997. And from there, and from, of course, the meetings he's gone back to attend, he's become, I think, close with someone you may have heard of um, called Barack Obama. And um, so you can probably give another lecture, David, on all that's happening in US politics and things that um, we want to reflect on in terms of President Obama. But really breaking ground in his, in his efforts um, in terms of studying law. David was elected as Labour MP for Tottenham at the age of 27 in the year 2000, and served nine years as a minister in the last Labour government. At the age of, I think, 40, um, he's got a career of a 65-year-old already, and, um, and I know he's, he's got a huge amount more that he wants to do. And if you look at what he's done since leaving government, he has established and now chairs an all-party parliamentary group on fatherhood, and has been a leading voice for the country, for our nation, beyond the riots, which of course uh, were originated in, in, in Tottenham and the community there. I just want to read you two quotes that I found fascinating from David's recent book, Out of the Ashes. Uh, there's, a, there's so many gems in there, it's hard to pick, pick a few, but let me just read you a couple. One on the riots, and then one on family, and then I'm going to sit down and hand over to David. <laughs> this is about the riots. These riots cannot be explained away simply by poverty or cuts to public services. That the vast majority of young men from poor areas did not take part in the violence is proof of that. Many young men showed restraint and respect for others because they have grown up with social boundaries and a moral code. They have been taught how to delay gratification, to emphasize with others rather than to terrorize them. Those values are shaped by parents, our teachers and our neighbors. It is when these relationships break down that our young people draw their values from elsewhere. A grand theft auto culture that glamorizes violence. A consumer culture fixated on the brands we wear, not who we are and what we achieve. A gang culture with warped notions of loyalty, respect and honor. And on family, he wrote this, well not born free as we like to believe, but dependent on our parents. As we grow older, a good life depends in large part on the strength of our relationships with family, friends, neighbours, colleagues and strangers. It is contingent on a society characterised not just by liberty, but by mutual respect and mutual responsibility. When this breaks down, it takes a lot more than police officers to put things right. My concern is that while we may be less judgmental, we are also less compassionate, civil and supportive of one another. And finally, across Britain today, Millions of parents find themselves with the cruel choice between making enough money to provide for their children or having enough money to spend time with them. These are some of the things I think David is challenging the political community, but also the country, to wrestle with, to think about. Not just in London, but um, as I say, across the, across the nation. It is a real pleasure for us to host you tonight, David. Thank you so much for being with us. And we're really excited to hear about what you have to say in terms of family and community in a good society. Please welcome David as he comes to speak.
Eventually I went there and she said, um, let me take your coat off and I'm going to come back in a minute. And I was only, what, nine, ten? I thought she said, take your clothes off. <laughs> They're often maligned by people like me who worry, uh, in a sense, about the Westminster echo chamber and our connection to the outside world. But recent history tells us that it's in institutions like this one uh, that the big ideas behind governments are often shaped. In the 1980s, it was the Adam Smith Institute and the Centre the policy studies which provided the intellectual energy behind Margaret Thatcher and her brand of free market economics. And in the 90s, it was Demos and IPPR, which helped Tony Blair and Gordon Brown reach a synthesis uh, within the third way. And since midway through the last decade, the CSJ has been the most fertile ground for ideas that David Cameron has sought to develop under the banners of the Broken Society uh, and the Big Society. Now, it's easy when you have that kind of success to fall victim to a few temptations. Temptations to chase colonies rather than new ideas. To carry on talking to those who are already listening. To become the in-house think tank for one politician, party, or leader. That's a mistake, especially if you aspire to longevity or to intellectual renewal. And thankfully, these are pitfalls that the Centre for Social Justice has done well to avoid. It was very wise to appoint David Blunkett as your co-chair. He is a man who I admire deeply and who will serve you well. And it was groundbreaking to bring together Ian Duncan Smith and Graham Allen to forge a consensus on the importance of parenting to children's character and life chances. And it was generous to host this lecture series with three Labour politicians. And you, of course, timed it well, because we meet together at a time when there is a real and genuine interest within the Labour Party about what can be learned from our conservative, with a small c, political tradition. Ed Miliband's One Nation Labour was the most, obviously, high-profile articulation of this. And there's obviously substance behind the soundbite. 
click onto the Labour List website this week and you'll see people from all parts of the Labour movement writing about what One Nation means to them. Every shadow ministerial team is toiling away at forging new ideas and directions in the mould of One Nation politics. At its core is an understanding that people are passionate about what needs to be conserved as they are about what needs to change. And it is fundamentally a belief that you cannot nationalise the good society. Blizzards of rules, regulations, targets, measures, instructions, inspections will not make our world fairer or more virtuous. And it's a renewed appreciation of the role institutions have in binding people together and making our values resilient when the rest of the world is changing around us. Perhaps the most relevant lesson for tonight is that politics starts with society as it is, shaped by experience and encounter, rather than dispassionate academic dogma. So when you're invited to give a lecture on the good society, you should avoid, it seems to me, at all costs, veering into abstract discussions about the true meaning of equality or the paradoxical nature of liberty or anything else that would be best suited to an undergraduate seminar. Rather, it's better to say something about the kind of society that we have, what we might like to preserve about it, and what we ought to change. The Broken Society was, of course, the first part of this analysis for the incoming government, uh, or the conservative part of it, at least. It was certainly a contested story, with many on the Labour benches keen to point to the ways in which Britain had moved forward rather than entered into some kind of moral decline. But the narrative was a powerful one, and it was dramatised by some graphic, real-life stories that made their way into the public eye. Cast your mind back not so long ago, and you'll remember. Karen Matthews, who was kidnapped by her own parents for the sake of some ransom money. Baby Peter Connolly, a little boy in my own constituency who died at the hands of those who were supposed to be caring for him. The two boys from Edmonton, aged 10 and 11, who tortured and kidnapped two of their peers. These were the images painted in primary colours to accompany the Broken Society analysis. They meant that the broken society was framed in a crude terminology of a feral underclass, a phrase that was revived following the riots in August last year. Yet things are never this simple, because the unease felt by a great many people today is not just about life in Britain's inner cities. Rather, it's also about the values and the conduct of those at the top of British institutions as well. In recent years, we seem to have lurched from one crisis of this sort to another. From bankers who fix LIBOR rates to politicians who help themselves to duck houses and flat screen TVs. From global companies who do not feel obliged to pay their tax like the rest of us, to newspaper editors who sanction the hacking of phones. From the senior police officers who failed to hold rogue journalists to account, to BBC staff who prioritised their Christmas TV scheduling over the exposure of a heinous crime. The problem is not that we have an underclass living by separate values to the rest of us as some of us would have it. But neither is it simply the case of a ruling class that is out of touch and out of control. The problem is a wider sense that society simply does not hang together in modern Britain. That we don't feel part of something bigger. That we don't feel connected by a common identity. That we don't feel confident 
that we share at least some of the same values. What makes this so frustrating is that we know that things can be much better. The London Olympics showed us what we've been missing in a sense. A national story told beautifully by Danny Boyle and embraced by the country, a sense of purpose and achievement lived out by our athletes, a feeling that you really were taking part, whether surrounded by thousands in the Olympic Park or sneaking a glimpse of events from the comfort of your um, front room or your desk at work. I'm not being overly optimistic. I know that we can't have the Olympics every week, but before the memories fade, we have to understand what made London and Britain so special to live in for those momentous weeks. Because it took more than government, fiat, calling for a clearer national identity, more connected communities or stronger unions to bring that together. It took effort and leadership to bring people together. It required investment and partnership between the public first and private enterprise. And above all else, it needed an institution that united a nation of many people around a single experience. Take just one aspect of the Olympics, our games members. It was their warmth and pride while they lined the roots of the stadium that struck the spectators as much as the talent of the athletes competing inside. At the closing ceremony, it was them that received the loudest eruption of cheers. Here was an activity that worked for the individuals involved. Few things can ever give them greater self-confidence than helping to deliver the biggest ever event that captured a scene in living memory. And few things can make you prouder than every new caster, pundit, and athlete singing your praises. But it also worked for the wider community. It forged friendships that will last a lifetime and brought together from all ages, all creeds, all races, and all religions, in one place, the work and endeavor of a common cause. Why must this end with the extinguishing of the Olympic flame? This ambition, after all, was the starting point for the big society. I've been calling for a national civic service for many years, often to the detriment of my own popularity, <coughs> with Downing Street when I was a minister, and to its credit, this government has made the first small steps towards that goal. Like the games makers, this is a scheme that works for the individual, helping to cultivate what uh, Robert Baden-Powell, the founder of the Scouts, called a spirit of self-negation, self-discipline, a sense of humor, responsibility, helpfulness to others, loyalty and patriotism in young people. Like the games makers, it works at the level of community, creating an encounter culture where it's easier and more rewarding to meet, interact and understand others. I also think the government was right to put money aside, incidentally, to train 5,000 community organisers, bringing them to people together in the areas in which they live to tackle shared problems. I've seen what organisations like London Citizens can achieve through ideas like the City Safe Initiative, where businesses offer their premises as safe places for anyone that feels threatened. It's about a community standing together and communicating with one another. These are not complex ideas, but they require leadership to pull people together around common priorities. But before we can philosophize about a renewal of community, we have to revisit the bedrock on which those relationships are built, the family. Because we are not born free, as we like to believe, but dependent on our parents. The family home is where our character and values are formed. It is there that we first learn to speak to others, to feel compassion, to forge our first relationships. Get this wrong, and we're more likely to drift towards crime, depression, and dependency. 
get this right and we're on track to lead healthy, successful and productive lives. Here, the government has made strides in widening access to parental support. They have rightly right, made parental leave more flexible and accessible. They've made progress in providing relationship support to those parents that seek it. There are, of course, though, areas where I disagree. I don't see marriage tax breaks as a sensible use of taxpayers' money. I cannot for the life of me understand why a child support agency should charge mothers for collecting the money that they're owed. Yet there is a conviction behind the government's family policy which is not in dispute. There is, however, a caveat to all of this. Politics is not just about what government can do to promote family and community. It's also about what must be done to protect them from the pressures of the modern economy. And it is here, more than anywhere else, that the big society falls short. It was conceived in an era where growth was taken for granted and our economic model was not up for discussion. And it shows. Because this government is making the same mistakes that successive governments have made to try to separate the kind of economy we have from the kind of society that we have. New Labour did it. The economy for us was seen as a source of wealth and generation, producing tax receipts that could be spent by the Treasury on creating a better society. <coughs> and Cameron's Conservatives have done it too. This is Oliver Letwin delivering a speech on Cameron's Conservatism in 2007. He said, instead of arguing about systems of economic management, we have to discuss how to make better lives out of the prosperity generated by the free market. Now, we've all made sweeping statements that we regret, and speeches like that have a particular awkwardness now in light of the global economic crisis which took place just a year later. The crash was a turning point, and not just because it revealed to us that our economy was more fragile than we thought, it prompted us to look again at the relationship between our economic model and our social framework. The fundamental insight is that the marketplace and the people and companies that operate within it cannot be neatly separated from society. The hours you work, the amount you earn, the shops on your high street, the adverts on your TV, the home you can afford, are inseparable from how you exist as a social being. But for years, we've lived with politics trying to draw a neat line between the two, and it hasn't worked. Because there's no use spending millions on a national civic service if children's values are still corrupted by a consumer culture from such a young age. It's no use promising wider access to parenting classes if parents themselves work such long hours that they're never around to see their children. And it's no use training community organisers if people have no power to make a change, whether that is to do with their local high street or the bedsits that they call home. Yet this is what's happening and it's undermining many of the very things the big society is supposed to be building. Many parents already face the cruel choice of whether to work long enough to be able to provide for their children or have enough time to care for them. In the absence of a living wage, the choice often means taking on an extra shift at work in exchange for reading a bedtime story to your children. Yet free market tears still clamour for cuts to the paltry sum that is the minimum wage. Thousands of other parents rely on flexible working rights to help them balance caring and earning a living. But the government's employee owner initiative will see workers exchange their flexible working rights in exchange for a meaningless tax break on share ownership. 
with the worry that they might not be able to be there to parent their children, there comes the ever-present concern about what, who will do it or how it will be done in their place. Advertising and marketing executives vie for children's attention during adverts on TV, keywords on Google are splashed across uh, 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 websites that then generate the desire to go and buy diet pills or knives or whatever. And of course, we still have the challenges of how we package food and drink. Pleasantries are exchanged about responsibility in advertising, but companies like Facebook continue to offer advice to companies on how to target specific students at individual schools if they so want to. It's this access that makes the children's consumer goods market alone worth 99 billion and going up. Children as young as three are more likely to be able to name the golden arches of McDonald's than they are their own surnames. And children as young as 10 can recognize over 400 brands in this country. So what's the use of family support if we conversely tolerate the deliberate unsolicited breaches into a child's life of advertising firms? What use is it encouraging our teenagers to value hard work and community spirit through civic service when we make no effort to roll back the power of brand names that entrench the need for instant gratification, individuality and unbridled materialism? Community depends in part on a sense of place Yet people see this draining away and their voices aren't being heard. It's no use training community organisers to mobilise communities if you refuse to listen to the voices when they rally. There's no worth in creating and funding hundreds of local area initiatives only to fetter them when central government decides to legislate. And there's no point in organising residents into fledgling community land trusts for lack of government support to leave them with a paltry sum to, to, to supply homes. And when just 61% don't expect ever to be able to own their own home in London, what use is it to speak about localism and civic activism when residence is so transient in so many communities in London? What use is it to speak about aspiration when the first ambition of any young family is to own a place of your own, quickly slipping out of sight in our modern economy for so many young people in our country. So there's no place for talking about the society we want to see without talking about the nature of the economy that supports it. So I finish where I started. I want to make an appeal to the people connected to this institution. It's not to give up on your passions for family and community life, on committed relationships and responsible parenting, or penal reform and drug rehabilitation. Instead, it's to develop the political economy which goes alongside them. <coughs> I'm not the first to point to the contradiction between economic liberalism and social conservatism. While it's proving to be the undoing of an agenda, the big society, that had great potential but is coming up short. What I can say is that the Labour Party is ready to listen. We will take the One Nation idea into the next general election. It will be a story about pulling people together and doing the right thing by others but it will be different to the labour politics of recent decades because it will seek to integrate an economic analysis into that story rather than hive it off to a few economists in the Treasury. The Centre for Social Justice could be one of the places that helps to build that story. And I hope that the conversation tonight is a small contribution, of course, to that, but nevertheless 
are we watching what CSA produces and how it provokes and prompts to get that more integrated society that must be the foundation of the social justice that has been called in this country now for so many decades and 